Hello and welcome to the COM300 module on cluster criticism. Our objectives are to first recognize the central elements in Kenneth Burke's perspective on symbols that led to the development of cluster criticism, and second, to apply the tools and steps of cluster criticism to develop insight into the perspectives and motives of the rhetoric. A working vocabulary, again, is your responsibility. So what is cluster criticism and what critic kind of helped develop this method? Cluster criticism is the analysis of what goes with what, or what is against what. It's almost like a word association exercise um, where they flash certain words at you and you respond immediately. It's, it's kind of using that logic that you're going to reveal certain things about you um, by your word choice and placement. The critic is Kenneth Burke, a fellow I wrote my dissertation on, a very uh, complex, interesting, and storied literary critic. He's a language theorist. He's also the develop the developer of dramatism, which is another somewhat related perspective that we will get to uh, later in the course. So why do we do cluster criticism? And what are the associational clusters? Um, how do they function? Well, we use these associations to identify the frame of mind, that is the perspective, the lens maybe, or even the motives of the rhetor. <clears throat> we look in, in the speech and we see what are the important terms and what gets associated with those terms. What are the associational clusters around those key terms? And then from that we begin to derive, you know, what, what's going on here in the mind of the person who wrote or crafted this speech. What's important about Kenneth Burke about identification and terministic screens? For Burke, persuasion is identification. So as, as animals that share, have physical bodies, we're separated by nature. We're, we're like not the same person, right? So we're different. As a result of that, we also do share certain similar aspects. So, for example, um, I might uh, identify with you by sharing that uh, I used to turn my papers in late, or that my GPA wasn't that high when I graduated, um, or um, I might just share something about George Mason, um, where, you know, go Patriots, um, and uh, how's our team doing, right? So, in that instance, those are areas that make us consubstantial were like sharing substance. And that's what Burke essentially is talking about. Identification provides persuasion through both commonality and antithesis. Unpack that just a little bit. A politician can go to a group of farmers and say, gosh, you know, I lived on a farm once. Um, that's a kind of a commonality identification. I share something with you. But some of the most powerful identifications are actually against someone else or something else, right? So, you know, it might be that um, in, instead of rallying around the Patriots, I might say, you know, let's, let's go get the Seahawks. You know, let's crush them. Let's kill them. Um, and in that instance, I might be building identification by antithesis. So we are together against something else. Terministic screens are screens that we each have through our lifetimes, our symbols, our experiences and everything have created this kind of um, screen through which things, you know, pass or sometimes don't pass. Um, as an example, you know, maybe when you were young, there was a dog you were scared of that bared its teeth or growled. And um, I had an experience like that. And so it that as a terministic screen, it took me a while to, to handle that and to recognize that not all dogs are dangerous and I don't have to be really scared around all dogs, right? So it's kind of a powerful 
screen that developed when I was young. All right, so um, when we examine associational clusters, we're really looking at that terministic screen, right? A terministic screen selects certain things, deflects certain things, right? And reflects certain things. So it's no surprise then that when Democrats and Republicans sit down to watch a presidential debate, guess what? The Democrats think the Democrat won and the Republicans think the Republican won. And in part, that's because of their terministic screens, their way of interpreting the world. While the terministic screen is not particularly conscious among people, you, know, you don't think, oh, I, I'm afraid of uh, dogs because, right, you, it's often not a conscious thing that you have, but because it's within you and it's part of your, your motives and the way that you interact with the world, when we reveal that by looking at the associational clusters, by what goes with what, we can sort of reveal an, uh, an underlying reality about a person, about a personality, about motives, and so forth. All right, so what are the three steps for analyzing clusters? Well, first is we identify key terms. We can do this in a couple of ways. If we look through a, uh, a speech, or we take a speech um, and, uh, um, and we put it into some kind of online word count thing, we can tell by frequency what are the most common words. And I could tell you the and 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 a, those aren't the common words. We're looking for, um, you know, more like the nouns and the verbs and so forth. All right, so that's frequency. But you can also identify a key term by intensity, something that's used that contains a tremendous amount of emotion, even though it might only be used once or twice, right? So frequency and intensity for identifying the key terms. Once we've identified the key terms, then we go through the speech and we find that key term and then we chart, we write down, all of the other terms that are nearby. All of them. And then we go to the next key term and we chart all of the other terms and the next one until we've got all the terms charted for that particular key term. And then we start over. Usually there's three or four or five key terms that we look at. Once we've got these lists of what are associated around these key terms, that's when the third step comes in and we start discovering an explanation for the artifact. We ask ourselves, what are the patterns here? What goes with what in the mind of the speaker? Um, Foss talks about agon analysis, and agon is basically conflict. And so an, another possible approach is to not just see what goes with what, what is associated with the key term, but also what goes against what. Are there, are there contradictions in this worldview? Because those can be interesting as well. All right, so how are word clouds uh, an aid to cluster analysis? Well, if you do wordle.net or tagzito.com or any other word cloud thing, usually when you run a word cloud on a, on a body of text, the larger ones that come up in the word cloud are the more frequent. So you can kind of chart it by that. Um, <clears throat> or you can try an online word count service like textalizer.net that's with an S, textalizer with an S, dot net. You cut and paste the speech into the box and click Analyze the Text, and it'll tell you the word, the word frequency um, throughout the entire text. There are other more sophisticated word count and analysis tools available on the internet, and some of them have been used by different critics to kind of supplement or uh, aid to the cluster analysis. In Domenico's cluster analysis of Jimmy Carter's speech, what are the key clusters and what does she conclude about Carter's efforts? Well, this is, this is an interesting paper. Right, I'm going to go through this one at more length. 
This is the analysis of uh, um, Jimmy Carter speaking at Brandeis University. Okay, so the occasion was he had published a book called Palestine, Peace Not Apartheid. Um, and at first, there was resounding silence. Right? The president publishes a book and no one says anything. Right? And then the attacks started coming. Because supporting Palestine and their needs was not a particularly popular um, kind of a position in the United States. So, um, for some people. So, um, she went through and did uh, a, 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 a sort of a preliminary analysis. And her research question was, how can a public figure model an ability and a willingness to reopen genuine debate about a highly charged, divisive public issue? How do we publicly address those issues that are so divisive that it's very hard to get dialogue in public spaces about this issue? So, came up with five clusters. I'm not going to detail each one, but we'll go through. The president talks about agency, being an active leader. Words that talk about the milieu or the situation, the countries and the people that are involved in the the Mideast, and talks about his values going beyond just a political kind of a thing to an almost holy task for finding peace. The second cluster, United States in America, talks about organizations and identifies a number of organizations within the United States, and then also talks about Jewish culture and how strong that is in the United States and immigration and the Holocaust and, and uh, how important Jewish culture and, and heritage is to the United States. The third cluster is Israel or Israelis. And so again, we've got four different clusters around this. One has to do with the organizations um, and they list the organizations in uh, Israel that are um, uh, related to this issue. The values, how Israelis dream for peace and for human rights. The milieu, the culture is kind of unique, but still familiar to us, not completely strange. And strife, fear, being colonized, the violence, these, these kinds of conflict issues deepen the story a little bit. All right, the fourth cluster is Palestine or Palestinian. So Carter does the same thing here. Talks about the organizations around elections, around candidates, around the government, around the credibility um, of Palestine as a country, the values of justice, equity, fairness, and how similar those values are to other values by the United States and by the Israelis. The milieu is, of course, the Middle East and how all of the United States and Arabs and Palestinians and so forth are all linked. And the last one uh, is victimhood. Finds, uh, you know, words like checkpoint, fence, prisoners, colonized, cruel oppression. So this is a people that values peace, but is currently oppressed. And then the last cluster is peace. And so under agency, we have to make an effort, a call. We have to um, do something to exchange ideas, to develop a treaty. Peace requires actions by all of the entities and by cooperative shared values. So she found these clusters, interesting, um, but how does that answer a research question? Well, and here's what she says. The strategies that a leader can use when dealing with a divisive issue are first to establish credibility so that you know what you're talking about and you've been there and walked the walk. Second, to acknowledge the different parties and their perceived realities. Not just one reality, but each of them has a different perceived reality. Third, to focus attention on shared values and goals with repetition again and again and again. We have shared values, peace, justice, equity, human rights. Okay. To not focus on divisive words, to not spend a lot of time talking about divisive words. And finally, fifth, to refuse engagement with extreme, 
unlikely to change positions. So this is an interesting thing, a research question. The cluster analysis with the different clusters around the five key terms and then um, an analysis of, you know, what does this mean in terms of the research question? What are the key clusters identified by Gilmore and Jiang's speech on the handover of Hong Kong? And what strategies are evident in the clustering? Well, that's FOSS 2018, pages 99 through 103. And I'm going to leave you to talk about that. So post this, do you agree that hidden motivations and underlying reasons are likely to be revealed by unconscious word choice and placement? Does your subconscious, what goes with what, really reflect your worldview? Are Freudian slips real? Why or why not? And do you agree with other posts? offering you a cluster of wishes for peace and happiness and a great day.